We're talking with Tony Quinn, the former coach at Forest Hill Central and a member of the Michigan High School Across Coaches Association Hall of Fame from 2017. First of all, thank you for taking time out on a Sunday morning, <laughs> following your children to Detroit Country Day for, a, for an interview. Right. Right. And you should begin watching them. You're, yeah. you're kind of here. Yeah, well, so, I appreciate the time. Appreciate easiest the conversation to start pointing is, uh, Tony, where, where did it all start? Sure. Um, Love sports, obviously, like anybody who sits in front of this camera growing up. Um, had a grandfather who was a college football coach, and so in a, in a lot of ways idolized him and, and what he stood for and, and seeing old athletes come back and, and just, you know, the relationships that he was able to build. Um, I was fortunate enough to have lots of coaches along the way that um, I had those relationships with. And so when I got into education, I knew part of that was not only being a teacher, but also a coach. And so as I um, started my educational career, um, coaching football was um, uh, something that I did. I had played um, football at Hillsdale College, a little Division II school down the bottom of the state. Um, Gleak. Yep. Um, played for a great coach there, a long time coach, Dick Lowry, and um, just loved... Was that before Muddy Waters? After Muddy, after Muddy, Muddy, Muddy Waters. After Muddy Waters, yep. Okay. Um, just loved the camaraderie, the relationships, and just being around it. And so um, it was an, a clear next step for me to, to um, go into teaching and, and, and still have that athletic piece um, after, after teaching. A completely unrelated question. How yeah. does a relatively religious college like Hillsdale get the nickname Chargers. I'm just curious as to how that works. <laughs> I, I don't know the history around it. I think it's uh, changed a little bit since I was there. Um, the standards have definitely gone up. I don't know that I would be a but student. They've, they've all been Chargers, right? Yeah, they've been Chargers. Been the Chargers. I just wonder yeah. what the connection was. Yeah. Is it yeah. lightning bolt with God? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lightning bolt on the helmet, I have a horse as the mascot, and uh, it seems to work. Yeah. So. I just, I, I just yeah. always wondered that because that, that didn't seem to fit to some extent. <laughs> Not that it matters. But anyway, I, you've yeah. known for a long time you wanted to be an educator from an early Yeah, age. absolutely. come from a long line of educators. Both my parents were educators. My wife um, was a family of educators. She's an educator. And so um, just kind of natural for me to go into that field and wouldn't change it for a second. So Hillsdale to Grand Rapids. Yep. So um, post Hillsdale, um, got a teaching job in Grand Rapids in the Forest Hills Public Schools. I uh, started going to grad school. I was in Grand Rapids. My wife simultaneously um, was in Grand Rapids as well. Um, and so we made that our home. Um, she was born and raised in Traverse City. I had kind of kicked around the state of Wisconsin through my childhood and then ended up in Traverse City. And so. Um, you know, despite the connection to Traverse City, Grand Rapids was perfect for a young couple and wanting to raise a family, and we got connected into good school districts, and it was it became home for us. I should point out you went to Traverse City, St. Francis. Yes. Um, versus Central, or obviously. Yes. At the time, yeah. At the time, it was St. Francis or Central. My wife went to Central, and so. Um, great athletic traditions at, at yeah, St. Francis. Both schools, yeah, yeah. yeah. Played amazing. football for a great, great football coach, Larry Sellers, and. Um, baseball and basketball and so was involved in all those things and and it goes back to my previous statement those relationships you know still still keep in touch with a lot of those guys and uh, it's just a great experience for me so you end up in central now you're teaching and at some point you're going to yep. get involved in coaching you yeah take us yeah to sure so um teaching middle school in forest hill central um immediately got involved coaching football um they had had a uh, pretty strong team in the and i'm this is dates me a little bit. Obviously, late 90s, um, Tim McGee, Hall of Fame uh, football coach, uh, great great mentor, um, was running a really strong program and wanting to be a part of that was, uh, was an obvious thing for me. And so did that for a couple of years and um, got that kind of passion, like I, I love this, I want to want to do this, um, but I want to do it as my own, you know, I want to be a leader of a program. Um, felt like I was able to relate to kids, felt like um, I was ready to take that next step. Um, didn't have the football knowledge that uh, Coach McGee or a lot of other guys did. Um, and it just so happened that at, at that time, Forest Hills as a district had made a decision to take what was a cooperative program between the three high schools, Central, 
northern and eastern and split them up. And um, Was this it, prior to the MHSA? So it was MSA? Uh, post MHSA. Okay. So just a couple of years though, 2007. Okay. So northern and eastern were going to combine and be their program and central um, was going to be its own program. And the coach who was leading all of that at the time decided that um, it was time to move on. And so both northern, eastern and central needed a coach. Um, just having a relationship with um, Clark Udell, our athletic director at Central, he said, hey, I need, need a coach. I know that you're passionate about being a head coach. I'm going to give you a shot. And uh, not knowing anything about lacrosse, my first purchase was lacrosse book for dummies. I uh, watched an old NCAA championship weekend on a VHS tape, and that was kind of my baptism into uh, lacrosse. And then... Fortunately, I became surrounded by a very supportive community, some tremendous athletes. Um, and so my piece was really kind of develop a program, give it an identity, um, and really, recruit's not the right word, but promote it within, within the school system so we just had athletes upon athletes playing the game of lacrosse, and that's what I did. I was going to ask this question a little bit later in the interview, but yeah. I think it's a point to, I would like to make now. Yeah. Per capita, Grand Rapids puts out more athletes at a higher level, college level, mm -hmm. than most of the rest of the areas do, it yeah. seems to me. Yeah. If you look at Rockford, if you look at yeah. or East Grand Rapids, you've Absolutely. certainly before still Central. Absolutely. Um, other teams are starting to come. Sure. Uh, Spring Lake's got a really yeah. good program. Yeah. A number of them. What, is it the water? Is it, <laughs> is it what, what is the, what seems to be the model over there? Is it all for one? I, what's the approach? I've asked that of other coaches from over there, and I don't, really get a specific answer yeah well from so you, you mentioned athletes 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 Is yeah that, it starts so with that. yeah so so my so my job really ha having that sports background not lacrosse but football basketball and baseball like I could see you know kids who were athletic and could could play sports and so my my job in that position was hey what do you what about lacrosse pick put a lacrosse stick in your hand let's see how this works you know it's great it's got all the all the great characteristics, as, as you know, of, of all the great sports, the contact, the speed, the hand-eye, the teamwork, the spacing, all of that stuff that you get from basketball, soccer, hockey, football, you know, those all mesh into that one sport, which is why it's such an amazing, amazing game. And so from a Grand Rapids standpoint, I think it was unique from the sense that all of these programs were kind of coming up at the same time. You know, East Grand Rapids had always been that that premier program with the multiple state championships and the history and Forest Hills was kind of always uh, biting at their heels and then you have new programs in Rockford and newer programs Rockford the cooperative Northern Eastern team and then as you expand out on the west side of town like all of those teams are kind of growing at the same time and I think that made for a, a unique situation where there was a connection between coaches um, but also a connection between players that kind of parlayed with the the um, kind of development of these travel programs. You had a lot of those kids playing together in the summer, and um, you know Tim Murray, coach at Grand Valley, a huge um, contributor to that. He and I got together and, and started a travel program together, and um, you know we were pulling kids from all the Forest Hills schools, East Grand Rapids, Rockford, all playing together, and and that developing those relationships and those friendships, and that carried off into their schools, and they were became, you know, kind of the leaders of their programs, and and that just kind of. In, you know, in recent so. times, though, that central program has elevated itself well beyond the rest of those programs. Yeah, they, I mean, it's, it's certainly yeah. Uh, it's certainly with CC and Rice. Yeah, and then that's and maybe Heartland now starting to hit down those heels yeah, a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. But after that, there's a yeah. bit of a drop off. Yeah, well, Coach Shire has done a great job with that program. One of the things that that all of us who were involved in it did was really start at the youth level. I had two little boys um, at the time, and part of my deal with my family was, you know, if I'm going to spend this much time in lacrosse, I've got to also help help my kids. And so starting that youth program and really being involved in the youth program, you know, it makes such a difference to kids who are in second, third, fourth grade to see varsity kids varsity coaches coming down and meeting with them and talking to them and they you know as I told my kids every single year like when you sit down and you think about the impact that you have on 
those players, it's, it's amazing. They want to be number four. They want to be number 33. They want to be number six, you know, when they grow up. They watch everything that you do, and that's that. You know, building that program, having those kids be role models, um, and then it just kind of, you know, it's addictive almost from there. They want to be lacrosse players in Forest Hills. Your first year at Forest Hills, what year? 2007 was my first spring in Forest Hills. You guys came pretty hard pretty fast. We did. We were very fortunate. Uh, Mike Jolly, one of the greatest men, yes. um, and especially men of lacrosse, he, he took me under his wing. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, my first two years there, we played them in the regional championship. And at that time, there weren't quarterfinals. So you made it past the regionals, you were in the final four. And that, right from the beginning, was a goal of ours, mine, to say, hey, we can do, we can win this, you know. Um, and our first year, we scored a goal. Um, after a two-hour rain delay, we scored a goal with one second on the clock to win a one-point, one-goal game. The following year, in 2008, did the same thing, but made a save with one second left to win the game. And so kind of a rivalry with De La Salle. Um, but just, you know, like any time you're involved in a winning program, it's contagious. And so for us to be able to advance to the final four and go to the state championship actually in our second year, but um, that's huge for a program. People want to be a part of winning programs. And you can go into elementary schools and you can, you know, talk to kids about playing lacrosse and say, look at, this is what we're doing, you know, on an annual basis. Um, so yeah, so start winning and that just becomes contagious. And now we're getting some of those kids that want to be, you know, that are athletes that, to play lacrosse. 2009 at the state semifinals. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to mention that. had to bring that up, didn't you? <laughs> I had to mention that. <laughs> yes, lost to an incredible Orchard Lake team. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the best games I've ever been a part of. You know, we, we and, I, and you might have different details, but I think we were up two with about two minutes left. Maybe, maybe one with a couple minutes left, and you guys tied it up, and then we went into overtime and, and Holt. And it was, uh, it was just an incredible game, and watching you guys play, um, you know, it was, it, you know, every loss is significant, obviously, but um, when you lose to teams that are better, like, you can't, you can't be too hard on yourself. I think for us, the validation that the year before, when I started 0-10, yeah. and St. Mary's had had a, three or four years, of, two or three years of not very good record, yeah. and then we won 11 straight the first year, because yeah. I kind of decided it was going to do it the way we wanted to do it, and then when we finally got to the state fund, Chris Breck and I kind of looked at each other after Shubak. We came into the into the into the timeout, and I had a, we're going to design a play. And uh, uh, Mr. Shubak, who's one of our players, went to UD. Said, "Just give me the ball." <laughs> and I never had that happen before in a game. It's like you know, like a movie thing. And I'm not a big big speech guy. Right. And everybody, he, he said it twice. And I said, "Okay, clear out." You know, the, the Hoosier thing at the end of the yeah. game. Give him the ball, let him go. Three steps, rip. Yeah. The yeah, you guys others, are incredible. The other side of the story is we've had to play Deal of Sale in a, in a summer the next year. We lost two of our really good players. And yeah, he had 18 shots that. from essentially yeah. high, high crease. Yeah. And he had five shots go through the goalposts. <laughs> so, you know, he had his moment. <laughs> but the, I still remember that game, obviously. Oh, yeah. The developments yeah. and the relationships we built yeah. and, you know, over the time that you do those things. And that's what the sport does. It is. It's incredible. And, you know, you win, you lose. Because we turned around and lost in the finals to a Grand Rapids team yeah. in overtime. Who we had beat twice that year. Right. So it's, know, it's one of those things. It, it's, what it's, it's the best yeah. of everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. And that's the unique thing about just the love that I have for the game. The, the community from the very beginning, you know, has just embraced me. Um, you know, whether it's Mike or you or, you know, Rick at East or Adam at East, you know, and... and I can go through the list, Rob, you know, um, Dave, you know, all those guys just, you know, in some way or another have, have, have influenced me in the way that I do things or have embraced me in a way that allows, you know, allows me to, to, to love the game and just to, to share that passion with others. When did you win your first state championship? So, um, from nine to 10, what happened in 10? So in 10, we won, um, we, um, 
came back with that team that, that you had beaten in 09, um, and most of the guys were back the following year, um, and just kind of had that mentality like it, it's it's got to happen, and and uh, and had a couple bumps in the in the road along the way, but um, got into the state championship game and 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 just dominated from the face, and, and it was clear early on in that game that the destiny had finally come come to fruition. So what's going through your head? The, you know, the last thirty seconds. Oh God! Now, I say that for, for two. Yeah, I know you're a coach and you're a good teacher, but all of a sudden you're in a sport yeah. that. It's not familiar to you. Yeah. And four years later, you're winning a state just, championship. Oh, That's pretty. It's, it gives me chicken skin just talking about it right now. Just, you know, you get that. You get that. Is it validation? Oh, you get that bucket of water dumped on you, and it's just like all the time, and energy, and just efforts put in have come. Yeah, have been validated, and and everything that I thought we could do happened. And it's just, you know, at that moment that you just come to that realization. It's almost a state of exhaustion, like a sense of relief. I remember I was so sick the night before that game. I think it was just nerves, like, you know, um, it's got to happen. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. And then, uh, you know, we had, yeah, just a great group of guys who just were going to make it happen. And, and a great group of coaching staff. And you had mentioned before the interview, and I wanted to make sure that I, I spent time. Yeah, I was going to say, talk a little bit about your family yeah. coaches that you yeah. had there. Your team. Um, Dave Kranzberger, who um, was with me from the very beginning, he coaches, at, has started a program at East Kentwood. Amazing guy. Um, the way that he... Uh, he was able to recruit kids to play lacrosse. He had that uh, family connection with the community and two amazing lacrosse players, coincidentally, as yeah. kids. So that worked out great well goal, for right? us. Yeah. <laughs> great goalie and great attackman. Um, both went on to play college lacrosse. And then, you know, it really became, you know, there was a turning point where we were kind of always on that edge. And um, Randy Lundblad, uh, who, who had a son, Trevor, in the program, and Laura, who actually played uh, for our boys teams at the youth level and she was dynamic. Uh, she's playing hockey at Quinnipiac right now in Division One hockey. Um, but Randy, um, you know, his knowledge of lacrosse and the way that he approached kids and the way that he approached the teaching of the game is just, um, it's it's almost indescribable. You know, as I mentioned earlier, like my my strength was the relationship piece, the ability to just connect with kids on a, on a on a level outside of the game of lacrosse, but when it came down to the X's and L's, there was nobody that we ever, and this is not a knock on any, any program or any coach, always felt confident that he was going to know more than the other, the opposing coaching staff, you know. Now his and background his, was Division so One. So he grew up, yeah, he grew up in upstate New York, went on to play um, lacrosse at Syracuse. Um, uh, it was an All-American, uh, captain of the team, scored the winning goal in the 1983 National Championship game. Um, and just, you know, you can't make that stuff up. And no, when he shows up on your doorstep asking if he can get involved in lacrosse, you know, that quote Bear Bryant said, you know, the best thing about me being a coach is I always hired smarter guys. I wasn't foolish enough to let, let Randy get away. And so not only, you know, from the lacrosse standpoint, but just from the, from the friendship standpoint, I had the, um, y you know, he's just a great, great guy impacting so many kids and so many adults. And it was, um, you know, well, the world, the, yeah, the world lost somebody, you know, in 2014. To to uh, yeah. So to come to cancer in 2014 and how old was he? Uh, 50 years old. We should point out he's a member of the Michigan High School. Michigan Coach High Hall School, yep. Um, For good reason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure I, he was inducted as well after he had passed into the upstate New York Hall of Fame. He was a tremendous player at West Jenny. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, his bloodlines of lacrosse run long and, and deep. And, um, you know, giving was, his eulogy at his uh, his... Funeral was one of the hardest things I had to do, but um, also one of the most impactful because to be able to speak about somebody who's that great um, is just a unique opportunity that you don't have very often. You lost the best friend. Yeah, absolutely. To say the least. Absolutely. Sports certainly lost somebody. Yeah. Impactful. Yeah. Was his 
was the sauce that he brought technically, sort of the last sort of part of the icing of the cake. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, you made, so you made the comment that you always knew that you would be slightly better than everybody else because yeah. he has knowledge on the bench. <laughs> and that's a, that's a yeah. great tool, yeah. right? So, so we, had, we had started to get all of those athletes, um, and then all of those athletes got to be coached by him. Right. Um, and so, you know, and then it just became kind of like an expectation. And I think it's continued on today, you know, in 2011, um, we lost a country day by a goal in the regional finals and they went on to win the state championship by like eight or nine goals. And then 2012, we won it. 2013, we lost in overtime uh, to Cranbrook. And so going to the state championship just became kind of an expectation and if we didn't do it it was kind of a disappointing season and that you know that's a tough place to be in as a coach it's a tough place to be in as parents and players um, and I think that was ultimately you know the most difficult part of it is I became very focused on that and it made the things that I was so successful at at the beginning a little bit harder you know? we figured out that you get seven more practices if you get paid finals <laughs> Well, think about this. Yeah. If you get past it and you take five years out, you literally have an complete, complete practice season in five years over everybody else. That's, if yeah. you added 35 full days yeah. to any team. That's good point. That's significant. It, it's, it's a significant. Yeah, absolutely. It's the, it's the playoff thing for colleges. Once you make the six wins, yeah. have that extra month of practice yeah. legal, and I'm, it doesn't change the process, but if I'm required to stop picking up a stick and you get 10 more days, <laughs> You're 10 days ahead of me. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's, that's true. Nice. That's true. The most, I guess everybody's always had that one moment in that run that you had. Is there, is there one that sticks out? Um, yeah, I would say, yeah. I would say that there's a day that sticks out because I think for me it's kind of a full circle day. Um, and that's the championship that we had in 2012. Um, we had done it in 10, um, a group of guys who, who I had really kind of, when I first got the job, they were the middle school kids that I got, that I was teaching, that I got to play lacrosse. And so that was kind of my my group um, and so as they kind of came up through they were very successful um, um, on and off the field and that was that was my group that I felt the most connected to I guess from that standpoint just because I had known them for so much longer you know I knew them when they were 12 years old having their first girlfriend and having them you know break up and uh, and then all through high school and so we show up to Birmingham 2012, we're playing Country Day, um, ironically, as we sit in the lobby of Country Day, um, and we're not supposed to win. They had Byron Collins as their coach from straight from the college ranks. They had won it his first year there. They had blown through competition uh, that, that season, and um, we were about to get off the bus, and one of our seniors got up and gave a speech to the team, and it wasn't something I had asked him to do. He just got up and, and you could tell that there was like this this tense urgency. Yeah, tense feeling amongst the group and he got up and we were in tears laughing when we got off the bus and it just kinda relaxed us all. And we got in and country what was, what was the young man's name? Steve Oberlin. Okay. Um, Steve is a uh, financial advisor now and uh, he's just uh, I mean just a great guy and that whole group there are in that group of kids, five or six guys in med school, five or six teachers, um, you know, just an amazingly successful group of young men. We got in the locker room, go down the field, Country Day gets off to an early lead, um, you know, and, and taking all the momentum from us. And then uh, we uh, got into a third quarter, we were down two, I think, at half, got into the third quarter, um, scored three goals, uh, maybe to their one, and so it was maybe tied rolling in the fourth. We scored early in the fourth quarter and then held Country Day scoreless for an entire quarter, including man down, like with two minutes left, and our defense just like, we're gonna win this game. And there's one of those no, days. Yeah, just one of those days we, we won a close 
low scoring seven six game, and as I alluded earlier, you know that feeling of being the champs is just unbelievable. And I say it's full circle because then I get on the bus and it's predominantly junior class. Get on the bus and all I can think about on the bus halfway home is, crap, we got we got to win it again next year with all these kids, you know. And then it just became like, you know, hard. Um, because I had put such high expectations on myself and the program. And I think that that um, rubbed off on the kids a little bit. And they knew that I was I'm always crabby about stuff and worried about lacrosse stuff. And, and I think it didn't allow them to play loose, like, uh, which, you know, which is why they were so successful in the first year. Are you a warrior? Am I a Are you a warrior? I'm a warrior, yes. <laughs> so just comes with the territory. Yes. If, I, if I talk to your wife, she tells me the same thing. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So it could be perfectly blue and sunny, and you're still checking the weather report. <laughs> One of the first things she said to me was uh, after I had been out of coaching for about a year ago. She said, "You know what? It's so nice not to have to talk about Cranbrook and Country Day and Orchard Lake St. Mary's in January. You know, like we used to have to do." <laughs> talk briefly. No, and I, and I, this is this is. I've had this question yet. Yeah. Yeah. You got to talk about it, your wife for 30 seconds because every wife, to every person who sits in that chair, including my own, it has to be either deranged or very special. And I'll say that yeah, they're very special. She's, she's so special. Um, it's it's because you adopt the team. Yeah. You yeah, adopt absolutely. the team. Absolutely. When I, I mean. No, it's we, we we I was at Michigan State for seven years on the girls' side, yeah. and my wife became the house mother. <laughs> and when I decided we were going to step out because I didn't want to travel 160 miles round yeah. trip, she actually cried because oh, it was she yeah. had to adopt these young ladies like they were their daughters. Yeah, she had no her own kids. It was it was traumatic. Yeah, I mean we would have the boys over for you know meals all the time. Uh, we you know take them get yester dog was a thing we like to do. We could get yester dog and have it catered to our house, and the boys would be over. Me, my daughter, who was. Going into sixth grade this year, her one of her first outfits was a Ranger lacrosse outfit that all the team moms had gotten together, and and my sons who grew up, you know, playing lacrosse. I mean, those were the guys that they looked up to, and so it. it when huge. I left, um, you know, it was hard for me to be away from it. But I think, you know, in a lot of ways, as you alluded to, it was it was hard for Corey too because it's just such a way of life. Uh, and she's ultra competitive, and um, yeah, for her to let to her to stand next to me, and I, w I don't want to say by me. She, she was next to me for all of those things, helping to organize, helping to do everything. You know, she was as impactful to that program as as anybody I've mentioned. Now you left Four Sills in fourteen. 2014 was my last season. You decided yep. to go home, so to speak. Yeah, so I, you know, had had. Um, Done the job. teaching thing, yeah. Had done the teaching thing, and and from a lacrosse standpoint, felt like you know I had reached the pinnacle. I had done everything that I set out to do, um, and my kids were getting old enough where I didn't want them to feel like dad was in the way or dad was influencing how they got put on teams and that kind of stuff, and and so. That was a piece, and then the piece about um, just wanting a new challenge career-wise. Um, I'd gotten an opportunity to be an administrator up in the Traverse City area public schools, and for my wife, who was born and raised there, and for me, who spent my high school years there, and having family there, it was a great opportunity to to get back home um, in a lot of ways. And and uh, well, it's also not a bad place to live. It's not a bad place to live. I mean, you look at the lake most yeah. of the time. <laughs> yeah. Nothing against Grand Rapids, right. you got to go about 40 miles yeah. to, get to, the lip, to get to the lake. Yes, and so yeah, from that standpoint, it was a was a very nice, a, a great opportunity and a nice change. Now somewhere along the line, you're back. <laughs> so explain that a little bit. So, um, as much as, uh, um, you know, starting anew was was a good thing for all of my children. It wasn't, and and. Uh, uh, Crandall, our middle child, still plays lacrosse, and he l absolutely loves it. And he missed he missed that, being in Grand Rapids and being in part of Forest Hill Central. And what his, what, he's going to be a freshman. He okay. is a freshman in high school as, of, what tom he, as of tomorrow. Why you're here today? Why you're here today? Yep. Yeah. Trying, trying out for the juice, juice cherries. Yep, yeah, uh, which he's been a part of the last couple of years. And his you know his friendship group is that group that plays lacrosse and plays football. And so he's. Uh, He'll be at Central. He'll be at Central, and so, so for him, we wanted to, you know, as a parent, and you, you know this, you know, you try to do 
what you think is right, and sometimes that, that's difficult decisions. And so we, um, as a family, decided that we wanted to give him the chance to, to, to do, live out his dreams and do that. And so I was fortunate enough to get an administrative job down in Grand Rapids um, in the Northview Public Schools, and uh, he has a chance to go back to Forest Hills Central. And so. Is there a coaching future for you? Um, I don't want to ever say no. Um, you know, is there, a is there a coaching future for you at Central? <laughs> I'm not sure if the if the regime there wants me around. To be honest, no. Uh, Shire has done a great job, and, and and he and I, Andy, has coached for me for the last couple of years, um, and has done a great job taking that, as you alluded to earlier, taking it to the next level, almost a dominant program. Um, you know, I always offer to anybody you know who who wants my help. I'm happy to help, uh, but I don't want to get in the way of anything. The obvious question here is, can a successful coach like yourself, who now has a child playing, can you be dad in the stands? <laughs> I am... Uh, <laughs> That's a hard... Yeah. I would think that... I've never been that, so I don't know... For the sake of all three of my kids, I don't do a very good job of... Um, I probably am harder on them than I ever was on any of my players, um, and so... Addison, McMillan, Crandall, I apologize to all of you. Um, so the answer to that question is no. So it's going to be hard. <laughs> Crandall will, uh, Crandall will ab avoid me at times after games. Um, but from a standpoint of being a fan, I'll absolutely be a fan and want the best for that program. My son played for me. He was an All-State lacrosse player. He was an All-State skier. He was a state yeah. champion. But I went to college. And long story short, uh, we have two rules. He got coached on our team by our assistant coach, so I didn't have any action. And on Friday night at dinner, he got the bitch about the coach, <laughs> which turned out to be quite resourceful because he knew it. that I'd shut up, which for me is hard, yeah. and he would you know, complain about the coaching staff yeah. or complain about something he didn't <laughs> like. And honestly, God, I learned something one. from that. Yeah. Every other kid gets to home, home and, and yeah. bitch about the coach. Yeah. Right. Well, if you're the, he's in the same car in the same house, <laughs> Sometimes, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it I've, took a while to get that dialogue. Yeah. Once we got the dialogue going, yeah. and some of it was nonsense. Yeah. But a lot, <laughs> of, it, a lot of it was just him venting. Yeah. And absolutely. me sitting there and shutting my mouth, which yeah. again, as I pointed out, was hard for me. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Yeah. I mean, for me, it'll be hard biting my lip. Um, not about the coaches, just about, about you know, having been in that situation, advising him, you know, in ways. Um, but he is much more competitive and much um, more uh, even keel than I am. And so he takes what I say and kind of has well, some on. Being a teacher and being a coach at the successful level that you are, does that give you more or less skill to back off as a, as a father? I think, I, I think as I've grown, matured, <laughs> which, which I always have more of that to do, um, I think I've gotten better at it. Um, okay. I get anxious for him because I know how, how, how good he can be um, and, and how hard he works at it. And so I just want the best for him. And so, you know, from the lacrosse standpoint, I don't think that I give him any more that he's getting from this program or from FHC. Um, uh, I know that, that, that that's not the case. So I need to be the dad, you know, and I need to support him how I can support him. So just take a quick right hand turn. The logo for Forest Hills yeah. is reminiscent of the Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. Yeah. Logo. Yeah. Was that by design? Um, that's just a personal question. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it I th it was, um, and then there became a trademark issue, and so if you look closely at it, the the C has lost kind of that accent it used to have on the top, like the Montreal uh, logo, and now it's kind of a more crisp C. And that happened while I was um, happened while I was uh, while I was there. Kind of a trademarking issue. And I think, you know, the reason it started was our hockey team adapted it and they were the first to kind of use that and everybody else kind of moved along with it. Because a beer question is, what does the H on the Canadian C stand for? And most people can't answer the question. The Habs, right? Yeah. yeah. But that's, I, I can't tell you how many yeah. trivia questions I've won because I just don't <laughs> know that that, that that fits. You're obviously, yeah. you know, Tune to that, yeah. that process. Yeah. It wasn't. I was just curious because it was always. Yeah. A, it was no, always, I love. Yeah, I love that logo. You know, love it's been logo. the same logo in 
the other thing you guys have set a trend in to some extent, the school has, is when everybody was doing the lax bro and multicolors and neon signs, you guys, along with the college guys, seem to be drifting into a much more muted look yeah. with uniforms. Yeah. So that's, that's not a huge point. But, yeah. You know, well, I think, you know, part of, part of what we tried to do was, you know, I, I alluded to it earlier, you know, we had, we had a reputation that needed to change when I took over. Um, it was kind of that lax bro mentality and, and kids who played lacrosse didn't fit in any other place. Um, and that's not bad or, or, or good, it just is what it was. And so coming in there, just making clear what our expectations were, what our standards were, that it was going to be about, because, you know, frankly, I didn't have the lacrosse piece, so I needed to do the character piece. I needed to make sure we were all the kids who were in the front of the class, being the leaders, the kids who were embracing others who needed a place to be. Um, you know, we were those student athletes. Um, and that was really my focus. And whatever came on the lacrosse field was extra, a bonus. Um, and that's, you know, why I wanted to, to have a program so we could promote those things. And so it was intentional that we didn't have that look. Um, we wanted to make sure that we carried ourselves the same way on the field that we did in the classroom or in, at home. And, and uh, that was the focus of that. A couple last questions. Yeah. One of them. We always talk about this growing sport and this new sport. Yeah. I keep trying to point out to people I'm interviewing them for the series that we're 50 years old. <laughs> you just alluded to the fact I think you're 50? Yeah. Getting, no, no, but close, getting close. But anyway, <laughs> I'm over 50, but that's not the point. Yeah. I'm pretty sure 50 years isn't young anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? So my question to you is, are we where we're supposed to be in the sport and the high school level? Ooh, and the follow-up question to that is, is are, is, are we going the way of soccer with travel or we should we be pulling these things back? And I've had conversations literally in the last two weeks with some of my Skyline players where they've decided that you know they can't come to a, a high school workout because they're going to their travel program. Mm -hmm. And I said, I hope you really enjoy playing for your travel program this spring because you won't be playing for me. <laughs> and as it turns out, there's a, some leverage there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, not that they shouldn't play travel, yeah. but the travel team now wants them to sign up for a year, they want them to be, you know, devoted yeah. to that. Not Absolutely. unlike the soccer program. Right. Well, we're sitting here in August, and we're trying out for a summer team for next year. Right. Yeah. So I guess my question is twofold. Is it, yeah. from what you see, are, I think there's some really good travel programs. Mm -hmm. I think there's some travel programs that yeah. have been critical for a long time about yeah. people that lie. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I guess, what's your take on where we are and maybe where we're headed? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. That's you know that's the question. I think, I think we're in a. Obviously, it's cyclical to a certain degree. I think we go through stages of travel becoming important, high school becoming important. I mean, I just think sports in general are such a phenomenon amongst our society that there's, it's, it's, you know, entrepreneurial for people to start travel programs to start lacrosse programs and soccer and hockey and all of those things and now I see these football um, programs popping up that you know you can play seven on seven all year long and you can go to all these academies run by such and such football program and and I think that that it's that balance between do you want your experience to be part of a high school experience and look back on that and be this was great or do you want your experience to be traveling the country, spending gobs and gobs of money, and that becomes your experience. And it's such a unique, a unique situation. I don't know, you know, I can say, I can say I wish it was, um, you know, not like that, but in the same token, I'm sitting here as my son's next door trying out for one of those teams, and that'd be hypocritical. Um, and he loves it, you know, he just loves the sport. I think ultimately it's, you know, it's a family decision, um, it's a school decision, and it's, you know, what works best for you, um, you know, what you want your experiences to be and where you think your investments should be. The Federation just brought some information that in 2000, and what would essentially be nine, ten years ago, there were 47% of high school kids playing at athletics. The numbers dropped to 39%. Yeah. And the biggest contributor is money. Yeah. Because kids don't have the money to be yeah. able to 
sort of keep up in this escalating yeah. war that we've, yeah. that we've got Absolutely. with all of the issues. And it puts us in a really precarious situation as far as a, as a state and as, um, as our athletic programs are concerned because you want that participation. It's such a unique, you know, you know you're being in schools. You walk into a high school on a Friday night in the fall and there's just a buzz in the air about being a part of fall sports and then the homecoming, whether it's football or soccer or volleyball or whatever is taking place. Um, you know, there's just a buzz. And that's something that I would never want a, a student athlete to not be a part of. I've never walked into a soccer club's, cross club's uh, offices and never seen a high school all-state picture up on the wall. Yeah. But I've seen a lot of high schools with, you know, trophy cases Absolutely. with all kinds of kids' pictures all the way back to 1912. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as crazy as that's going to sound, a picture on the wall when you're 17 doesn't matter. But when you hit 65, and I go back was, and look at what we did. Yeah. And I don't reminisce by any stretch. No. My, my son's exactly, picture is up you, at Water Vermont. I've yeah. got a picture up at, you know, yeah. when I played in school. But you're exactly right, and that's the and first that's, thought that popped into my head. And then you show your yeah. kids. The value of that becomes greater yeah. that you can't explain to somebody yeah. 17. Absolutely. You know, I'm to the age where, you know, reunions are starting, old, long reunions are starting to happen. <laughs> and you go back and you get a chance to reminisce and talk. And just like you said, look at that state championship right. picture, that all-state picture on the wall. And that's meaningful. Think it of all the kids meaningful. that walked through that hall that sure. may or may not have glanced at it or whatever. But the point is, you're not going to go and find an office anywhere that, that 20 years from now right. we can go back and see our such and such travel programs, Hall of Fame or whatever. And I wish we could have a conclave of some sort to get travel coaches together with high school coaches yeah. and sit down and talk yeah. and actually have a dialogue. And I don't think it'll ever happen because they're, I've done, you know, they're, yeah. they're diametrically opposed. I mentioned Dave Kranzberger. I'm on the board with Dave for the high mm -hmm. school coaches. And yeah. It's a conversation we have all the time. Yeah. Come talk to us. Because yeah. I'm getting to the point where I'm going to start being um, proactive about clubs that cheat and, yeah. and lie and yeah. that kind of stuff. I mean, <laughs> that's not necessarily yeah. a good thing, yeah. but there has to be, if we're going to be, if we're going to take this middle-aged sport that we have and, and, and move it forward, I think that's part of that process. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, I think in some pieces, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm at fault with this too, I think we want to see what the end result is before we go through the process of right. doing it. And that's, you know, that's kind of that millennial thing right now, right? We can move through things so fast that we don't actually stop and take the time to enjoy it, you know? Last question, what would you tell a young coach who has no background in a particular sport <laughs> that's possible to make the Hall of Fame in that sport <laughs> that's chosen by him? Or, or in this particular case, the sport yeah. who chooses you. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would you tell them? Well, we I'm, always talk about expertise. You gotta yeah, have all the expertise. Yeah, yeah. Apparently not. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, no, that, um, you look at the, the I, career you have. You learned. Yeah. So it's not impossible. And now here's the point: you don't have to be a Division One player to be a Division One coach, and that's yeah. been a standard in our sport yeah. at the collegiate level forever. Yeah, absolutely. And we're finding out that there's some really guys, smart guys. <clears throat> well, I think if you look at any sport, you find that you know if you dig deep enough, you find a lot of the successful coaches weren't necessarily successful in their sports. Um, I would say I've been very fortunate. I have a fantastic family. My wife has been of the utmost. Um, I was very fortunate to be in the community that supported lacrosse and wanted it to be successful. Um, personally, I think you have to be willing to stand on a ledge sometime and make, make tough decisions. You also have to be willing, have a growth mindset. You have to be willing to learn. And, and I was never, like I shared earlier, I was never the smartest guy in the room, but I was gonna make sure that working hard was a part of what I did and that I was open to, um, open to suggestions and open to other other things and um, you know establish those relationships because at the end of the day those are the things that are that are the most important um, you know I can't tell you how much it means to me when I get a text from a former player just saying hey coach just call, check it in see how you're doing I'm doing such and such um, or running into a parent of a former player and, and, and sharing a story about the impact that you may have had with them. At the end of the day, I think we all get into coaching not for 
the accolades, not for the wins and losses, but because we have a desire to lead people and to develop relationships with student athletes that we think will impact them. Because somewhere along the way, we had that same thing. Um, and, and I, you know, and so recommendations for a new coach, remember that that's, that's what it's about. It's not about having the opportunity to, um, you know, be in the Hall of Fame and do one of these interviews, which I'm sure I'll be embarrassed to watch, but it's the relationships that you establish along the way and the ability to, you know, know that your own kids, you know, role models were guys that you coached yeah. and that uh, that's how impactful that they are and those relationships are. Well, it's hard to be embarrassed by success in <laughs> class. And you mentioned earlier Mike Jolly being, you know, this great gentleman. I, I would simply say the same thing yeah. you say, that he's probably the nicest guy we've all met. Yeah. Right. I would put you not far behind 1A. Well, thank you. I and appreciate it. A great partner to the sport, great partner to the other coachings, other coaches in the area. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of folks who'd like to see you back in it. But to your efforts so far and what you've done at this point has been spectacular. So well, thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. And same holds true to you. I've always appreciated our interactions and what you've done for lacrosse on so many levels. And, and a huge congratulations, a very deserving congratulations to you on, on your induction as well. Appreciate it, Yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate cool. it. Thank you very much.